Good morning. It's a blessing for me to have the opportunity to share with you about the Lord this morning. It is a blessing for me to have the opportunity to help lead in worship with such talented musicians. It's a blessing for me to have my crack security team in place up here. So it looks like we're ready to go. Actually, these gentlemen are going to read some scripture for us in just a couple of minutes. But before we have the scripture reading, I wanted to begin this morning with a story. When I was 22 years old, I did not have all of my long-term goals hammered out. But there were some short-term goals that were very important to me. I was totally committed to eating every day and keeping the electricity on in my apartment. And that meant that I had to make a hard decision. It was something that I never thought I would have to do. And what I never wanted to do, if it's something that you do want to do with your life, I mean no offense at all, maybe this is your career aspiration. But for me, when I began my career as a telemarketer, I really felt like... I'd hit rock bottom when I signed up to be on the Tri-Seal window research team. And um, in the interest of total honesty, we were not actually doing research. But we were, what I was supposed to do is I was supposed to call up people on the phone and set up appointments for our crack team of agents to come in and present to you, the consumer, the Tri-Seal window system. And when you told me you were not interested, I was supposed to say to you, well, how could you not be interested in lowering your energy costs and making your home safer for you and your family? Now, there was another trick of the trade that I was supposed to employ. I had lists of phone numbers with names next to them, and if there was a man's name next to the phone number and a woman answered the phone, I was supposed to ask to speak to the man. And if the man wasn't there, I was supposed to say, well, can you tell me when he'll be back and I'll just call back then. And I realized to your 2019 ears, that sounds sexist because it is. It, it was the 1980s. Women had big hair. Men had big hair. We were making all kinds of edgy, dangerous choices. And so that's what they wanted me to do. So one day I call on the phone and I don't remember the name of the woman who answered. I'm going to call her Mrs. Galloway, just because I think Galloway is a really cool last name. And so Mrs. Galloway answers the phone, and so of course, I said, is Mr. Galloway there? And she said, no, he's at the cemetery. And without even thinking, I said, well, when do you expect him back? <laughs> and she said, you don't understand. He's at the cemetery. He's not coming back. Okay, so at that point, I decided I was going to change my strategy in these phone calls. Never again would I ask to speak to somebody who wasn't right there on the phone with me. And if they pushed back at all and said they weren't interested, that was fine by me. I was just going to wish them a nice day and move on to the next call. And I realized this was a breach of protocol for the Tri-Seal Window Research Company. But I also figured at the end of the day, they just want me to hit my quota of appointments lined up. And so maybe my success rate won't be the same as some of the other callers. But if I'm getting out of bad phone calls quicker then I can make more phone calls by the end of the day. And so even if my success rate is lower, I'll still make enough appointments for them to be okay with me. But apparently there's more than one philosophy in doing tri-seal window research, and mine was not universally appreciated. So at the end of the day, one of the supervisors stopped me as I was leaving the building, and he said, Tim, anybody can telemarket, but telemarketing isn't for everyone. And that was code for, you're fired, we don't want to see you again, which I quickly realized. And so what was interesting for me to process as I was walking out of the building was, okay, I really thought I'd hit rock bottom when I was hired at this job, and now I've been fired from it. So is there a level below rock bottom? Because if there is, that's where I'm at. And so I had to cope with the reality that I wasn't good enough to telemarket. And so my theme this morning is that feeling that probably I'm not the only one who has felt, that feeling of sometimes in life, this, this realization of, wow, I'm just not good enough. But before I get further into my message, uh, I would like for these gentlemen to read our scripture this morning.
<clears throat> uh, this is from the Holman Christian Standard Version of the Bible. Uh, this would be Mark 7, chapter 24. Uh, ooh, sorry, Mark 7, verse 24. Uh, he got up and departed from there to the region of Tyre and the Sidon. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, but he could not escape notice. Instead, immediately after hearing about him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to drive the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Although the children, allow the children to be satisfied first, because it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she replied to him, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, Because of this reply, you may go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. When she went back to her home, she found her child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. Thank you. <clears throat> so, I'm thinking as they're reading about, you know, bread on the table and the, the dogs getting the crumbs and stuff, there's, there's a person in the room with a shirt that says, I'm just here for the food. And I'm wondering, did that resonate with her at kind of the next level? I don't know. Um, okay, so this passage of scripture, this woman coming to Jesus because she needs a miracle and Jesus saying, you're not worthy. I have struggled with this passage. And so as I've read it over the years doing my devotions, I encounter this passage and where I focus is this idea of Jesus saying, you're not worthy, um, can't give to the dogs that which is for, you know, the sacred. And I'm trying to process this. And my process goes something like this. It, it sounds like Jesus is being kind of mean to her, but Jesus is really nice I mean, he's kind of rough with the Pharisees, but that's okay because they're Pharisees. But then he gives the woman what she wants in the end, so that's good. And the fact that she kind of had to push for it probably means it means more to her. So, okay, Jesus is still nice. And then I would move on to the next passage mentally. And the problem with my approach was I always miss the point of the passage. I was so distracted by this idea of having to convince myself that Jesus was still really nice that I missed the point that the scripture was trying to convey to me. And so it was only last year that I read an explanation of this passage that I thought was pretty fascinating and pretty powerful. And it came from a pretty unlikely source for me. Ironically, I read an explanation for this passage from an author named Timothy Keller. And it's not ironic because his name is Timothy and my name is Timothy. That's not irony. That's not a coincidence. Words matter. English majors? A little love? Okay, so the reason it's ironic that I would learn something like that from Timothy Keller is he's more of a reformed kind of Calvinist guy in his theology and I'm more of a free will guy. So why was I even reading his book in the first place? I wouldn't have been except Chase Benefil, who really likes books, was going on and on about how awesome Timothy Keller was and so my wife Angela bought me one of his books and so I read this in the passage about this passage and it was so fascinating. Timothy Keller makes the point that Jesus' words are the truth. This woman really isn't good enough for Jesus to intervene for her. And that's the point. None of us are good enough. But if we put our faith in Jesus, he loves us so much that he meets our need anyway. And so what's interesting is Timothy Keller, as he's writing about this, wants us to identify with the woman. And we probably don't think about this, but for most of us who are believers, when we read through the Gospels, we put ourselves in the role of the disciples. People following Christ who want to do the right thing, but sometimes do really dumb things. But we're trying. So we put ourselves in the role of the disciples. But in this passage, we are the woman. In this passage, I am the woman. And so I'd like to pause for just a moment and address my wife directly. When you thought about me preaching this morning, you probably didn't anticipate me standing in the pulpit and saying, I am the woman. So if we need to talk more about that later, we can. Okay, so we, like this woman, 
are not good enough. But Jesus loves us anyway. In an effort to bond with you, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story as a college student. I grew up in the church, like many of you, and it's kind of maybe concerning for you that the first time I look at the notes is when I tell you I'm going to tell you my story. Wow, how's that for authenticity? Okay, um, I grew up in the church like many of you. I made a decision to follow Christ at a young age, like many of you. I was 13, and I decided around that time, I felt around that time, I believed around that time, that Jesus was calling me to preach. I was going to be a preacher. I went to a Christian college in Kentucky called Asbury. It was a great place. They didn't have a religion department at their school. They've got a Bible department. So I was a Bible major. I'd never questioned anything I'd ever been taught about Christianity or the Bible. Growing up, I always just took it at face value because the people telling me stuff were people of authority in my life. And so I got to Asbury, and even though the things they were telling me were totally compatible with what I already believed, this additional information was making me think about things I hadn't thought about before. And I was beginning to have questions, and I was beginning to have doubts. And I was embarrassed by my doubts. I was ashamed of them. So even though I was surrounded by people who could have answered my questions, who could have uh, assuaged my fears, who could have solved the riddles that I was processing, because I was afraid to talk to them about it, I was really in a bad situation. What I was afraid of was somebody would say to me, wait a minute, you've got questions about this and you've been in church your whole life? Wait a minute, you came here wanting to be a preacher? And you still want to be a preacher because I did. I was convinced. I continued to pray despite my doubts. I was convinced that I would get to the other side of this and it would be okay. But I was afraid somebody would say to me, we're not going to let you be a preacher if after all of these years you have these kinds of doubts. I was afraid they would look at me and say, your faith isn't good enough. And so I buried those doubts and struggled for a long time. Now, Satan has a lie for every generation. And for this generation, he tells a lot of his lies through Twitter. And I'm not saying that Twitter is, like, universally bad, because there's really a lot of good stuff on Twitter. Uh, Lee Strobel's on Twitter. Beth Moore's on Twitter. John Christ is on Twitter. There's a lot of good stuff on Twitter. But some of the stuff that isn't so good is the dating advice. And just so we're clear, I'm not going to Twitter for dating advice, okay? I just see it as I'm looking at other stuff. But you get some input from Twitter like, if your man doesn't accept you just the way you are, he isn't good enough for you because you're already a queen. Just in case you doubted, you're a queen. Okay, now, men, if your ladies want you to change, then maybe... Maybe it's time to change ladies because you're okay, bro. Okay, so <laughs> that's what we're telling each other on Twitter. That's what we're saying to other people because we want them to say it to us because we want to feel like we're good enough because we know deep down we're really not. We know that if people really knew all the stuff we'd done Man, that would be humiliating. If everybody in this room could read your mind all the time, that would be humiliating. All the times when we look back on our own behavior, what we say, what we think, our attitudes, and think, man, I could have done better, Whew. all of that's tough. We know we're not good enough. But Jesus loves us so much, if we put our faith in him, he saves us. He meets our need. That's really good news. If I'm already, you know, really pretty good, it's not that big a deal if Jesus just kind of helps me over the finish line. But we are totally not good enough, like this woman who goes to Jesus, we're not good enough but if we put our faith in him, he loves us so much, it's okay. 
He will meet our need. Now, what's cool is there's other stuff we can learn from this woman in the story, like we need to pray more. She had a problem, so she went to Jesus. And we can't go to Jesus physically, but we can go to him in prayer. And so it's good to get this reminder from her life because the Bible tells us to pray ceaselessly, but let's be honest, we cease an awful lot. We should pray more. Now, the reality is we have just as much time today as we had yesterday. And for most of us yesterday, we really didn't pray as much as we should. And so rather than just throw out kind of a generalized, fuzzy, pray more, let me urge you to specifically figure out in your schedule times when you can plan to pray more. For example, I know a woman who loves to listen to the radio when she's driving her car. So she has decided in an effort to pray more when she gets in her car and starts driving, before she turns on the radio, she will spend some of that time in prayer. I know some people who have made the decision when they wake up in the morning, before they look at social media, they're going to spend some time in prayer. We can build into our lives more time to pray. And I would encourage you to do that. We can also learn from this woman. She had a problem, so she went and talked to Jesus, and Jesus talked to her. She got a message from God, and we can do that too. We've got a book full of messages from God. But we don't hear them if we never open the book. I was reading an interesting book on spiritual disciplines many years ago, and the author said, if you read about three chapters of the Bible every day, you could read the whole Bible in a year. That's kind of cool. Of course, three chapters is a lot. And for many of us, if we tried to sit down and start at the beginning of Genesis and read three chapters a day, there's a lot of thick content that would bog us down. We might get distracted, our eyes might wander. The author of this book on spiritual disciplines suggested that we actually start in three different sections of the Bible. Genesis 1, Job 1, and Matthew chapter 1. Read those on the first day and then move on. And here's another wrinkle. What if instead of trying to read three chapters in one sitting, what if you read one chapter when you got up in the morning? What if you read one chapter around lunchtime and then read another chapter before you went to bed? Now, not only would you be getting scripture throughout the day, but I think one of the cool things about doing it that way is if something happened and it messed up your schedule, like maybe one day you overslept, maybe one day your lunch schedule's a little weird, maybe one day you get back to your room and you're gonna read before you go to sleep, but you're so exhausted you lay down for a second and you go to sleep. One or two of those things can hit and you miss out on one or two scripture readings, but you might still read some scripture that day. So despite your schedule being upside down, you would still get that biblical content every day. That's kind of cool. What if you committed today to reading three chapters a day and then after a couple of weeks there were a couple of times that you missed? What if it took you a year and a half to get through the Bible this way or two years? You'd still get all the way through the Bible, which is cool because what many of us do who read the Bible regularly, many of us will cherry pick our favorite verses or our favorite chapters, um, chapters that are more interesting to you. You'll read books that are more interesting to you. You'll read this book, and then you'll read that book, and then you might come back and read this book again. And there are some books that we end up skipping over when we do it this way. So reading through the Bible methodically, um, reading more than we have been, there's a benefit to that. Now, there are some people in the room who might be thinking, you know, yeah, <clears throat> I should pray more. Yeah, I should read my Bible a little more regularly. But if I'm going to be realistic about this, <clears throat> excuse me, when I leave here this morning, I'm going to get caught up in the busyness of my day. And eh, knowing me, maybe nothing's going to change. So I would encourage you to think about someone who can hold you accountable with this. Invite someone to ask you about this periodically. Hey, have you prayed today? Hey, have you read your Bible today? The Bible is full of examples of people who do ministry together. People who do ministry in pairs. And certainly you, growing as a disciple, that is a ministry. <clears throat> this is so powerful, I can almost hear music in the background. Wow, it's like a dramatic scene in a movie or something. All right, now... 
There's another thought I want to share with you. The next thought I want to share with you is this. If you are like I was, if you've got big questions, if you've got doubts and you've been embarrassed by them, I would encourage you to pray for someone to talk to and go to that person. Don't be ashamed of your doubts. Your faith grows when you ask questions and trust that there's an answer and hold on until that answer comes. So from that point of view, the doubts can actually be kind of exciting for what they say about the direction you could be going in. So, you know, there's a verse that gives me a lot of peace of mind because there are some hard questions about God. The God who created the universe, we can't fully comprehend that God. And so there's a verse that really gives me a lot of peace of mind. It's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. John 14, 6. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Knowing that Jesus is the truth gives me a lot of peace of mind. You might ask me a question, and I might not have a good answer to it right off the top of my head. But knowing that Jesus is the truth, I find great peace in that. So the five points I want you to take away from this morning are, even though we really aren't good enough, if we put our faith in Jesus, he will meet our need. He will save us. And that's really good news. And I realize if you're writing that down, that's a really long point. But the rest of them are easier. Number two is pray more. Number three, read your Bible regularly. Number four, be accountable. And number five, share your questions and doubts with someone. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I pray as we leave this church building that we will not feel like we are leaving your presence. I pray that we will know we are not. Lord, I pray that you would help us realize, despite our shame, that you love us. I pray that you would give us the wisdom to pray more, Lord. I pray that when we are afraid, we would pray. I pray that when we are afraid, we would pray some more. I pray that when we're worried, we would pray. And when the worry comes back, let us remember to pray. Lord, when we're thankful, let us pray. When we're happy, let us pray. When we're lonely, let us pray. Lord, help us to be people who pray. Lord, help us to be people with a hunger for your word. Help us to be people who are vulnerable enough to make ourselves accountable to someone as we try to grow spiritually. Lord, and for anyone in the room right now who is weighed down by questions and doubts, show them the right person for them to go to. And if they don't get satisfactory answers there, I pray that the person with the worry and the doubt would keep on looking, keep on praying, keep on believing. Lord, thank you for this time that we could spend in your word. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.